In a previous video, we stated two facts about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of symmetric matrices. First, we said that the eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix are all real numbers. No complex numbers that are not real occur as the roots of the characteristic polynomial. The second fact that we stated is that the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix corresponding to distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal. There's also a third fact having to do with the eigenvalues of a very specific kind of symmetric matrix. If B is of the form A transpose A for any matrix A, then the eigenvalues of B are non-negative real numbers. Fact number one already tells us the, the eigenvalues of B have to be real numbers because B is a symmetric matrix. That's because if we take B transpose, which is A transpose A transpose, that's the same thing as A transpose A transpose transpose since when we take the transpose of a product, it's the product of the transposes in the opposite order. And A transpose and transpose is the same thing as A, so this is just the same thing as B. So B transpose being the same as B means B is symmetric. And so by fact one, we'll know that the eigenvalues are real numbers, but fact three says that even more, that they'll actually turn out to be non-negative real numbers if our symmetric matrix can be written in this form. So in the rest of this video, we'll prove these three facts. The first fact we want to prove is that if A is a symmetric matrix, then all of its eigenvalues are real numbers. We haven't talked yet in this class about numbers that aren't real numbers, about complex numbers. So first, let me give you just a quick review or primer on complex numbers. A complex number is a number like 2 plus 3i or 14.5 minus the square root of 7i or any number of the form a plus bi where a and b are real numbers and i represents the square root of negative 1. i is called an imaginary number because it doesn't exist as a real number. There's no real number whose square is negative 1. In a complex number of the form a plus bi, the part a is called the real part and the part bi is called the imaginary part. The conjugate of a complex number is the complex number that you get by switching the sign of the imaginary part. So for example, the conjugate of 2 plus 3i is 2 minus 3i and the conjugate of 14.5 minus the square root of 7i is 14.5 plus the square root of 7i. Conjugates are often written with a bar above them. So for example, if the complex number z is 5 plus 2i, then z bar, the conjugate of z, is 5 minus 2i. There are a few facts we'll need about conjugates. One important fact is that if you multiply the conjugate of a complex number by the complex number itself, you get a non-negative real number. That is a real number that's positive or zero. That's because if z is the complex number a plus bi, then z conjugate times z is a minus bi times a plus bi. And we multiply that out by distributing. So we get a squared plus a bi minus a b i minus b squared i squared. Well, i squared simplifies to negative one since i is the square root of negative one. So this gives us a squared, these two terms cancel, minus b squared times minus one, which is a squared plus b squared, which is a real number that's greater than or equal to zero. A second fact that we'll use is that the conjugate of a real number is the original number. So if you have a real number a, you can write it as a complex number by writing it as a plus zero i. And then the conjugate of a, 
is just going to be a minus 0i, which is the same thing as a, the original number. A third fact about complex numbers is that if you take the conjugate of a product, z1 times z2, that's the same thing as z1 conjugate times z2 conjugate. You can prove this by writing z1 as a1 plus b1i and z2 as a2 plus b2i, and this, then just working out both sides of the equation. The reason we need to know so much about conjugates of complex numbers is to define the dot product for vectors with complex entries. For vectors with real entries, say v1 equals 2, 3, and v2 equals 5, 6, we compute the dot product by multiplying corresponding entries and adding them up. This can also be done by taking the first vector and transposing it and multiplying it by the second vector using ordinary matrix multiplication, like this. That also gives you the product of corresponding entries added up. For vectors with complex entries, for example, these two vectors, we do almost the same thing. We just take the conjugate of the entries in the first vector first. So w1 dot w2 will be 1 plus 2i conjugate times 5 minus i plus 3 minus 7i conjugate negative 4 plus 3i, or equivalently, this product, which works out to minus 30 minus 30i. W1 dot W2 can also be written as W1 conjugate transpose matrix multiplied by W2, since that also has the effect of multiplying corresponding entries and adding them up, where the entries from W1 get conjugated first. Now you might wonder, why do we go to so much trouble of taking the conjugate when we do the dot product of vectors with complex entries? And one main reason is that way when we take the dot product of a vector with itself, we end up taking the product of conjugates of complex numbers with the complex numbers, something that always gives us a greater than or equal to zero real number. And so the dot product of a vector with itself will end up being a non-negative real number. And that means that the magnitude of a vector, which we can define in terms of the dot product of the vector with itself, that magnitude will always be a real number greater than or equal to zero, a very convenient property to have. Notice also that if our vector just happens to have real numbers as its entries, then taking the conjugate doesn't affect anything. It just keeps the real number the same, and so Sticking in this conjugate, if these have real numbers, is just the same thing as taking the ordinary dot product for vectors of real enter with real entries. So now that we've done that quick trip through complex numbers, we're ready to prove this fact, that if A is a symmetric matrix, then all of its eigenvalues are real numbers. So let's let lambda be an eigenvalue for A with eigenvector v. We're initially allowing for the possibility that lambda could be a complex number. Let's consider the quantity, the magnitude of av squared. By definition, that's av dotted with av, which we can also write as av conjugate transpose matrix multiplied by av. We're careful to include the conjugate here to allow for the possibility that AV, which is also the same as lambda V, could be a vector with complex entries. Now we've seen that the conjugate of a product of two complex numbers is the product of the conjugates. The, this extends to the product of two matrices, and so we can rewrite this as the conjugate of A times the conjugate of V transposed times AV. And since the transpose of a product is the product of the transpose in the other direction, we can rewrite this expression that way. And now, since A has all real entries, 
A conjugate is the same thing as A. But recall that A is symmetric, so A transpose is the same thing as A. And now we can use the fact that lambda is an eigenvalue of A with eigenvector V to rewrite AV as lambda V. Let me pull out the scalar lambda and rewrite AV again as lambda V and pull out the scalar lambda again to get lambda squared V conjugate transpose V, which is the same thing as lambda squared V dotted with V, or lambda squared times the magnitude of V squared. Let me just rewrite the first step of this string of equalities and the last step. And recall that V is an eigenvector, so it's definitely not the zero vector. So its magnitude is definitely not zero, which means that I can divide both sides by the magnitude of V squared to get this expression. Now I know that the magnitude of V squared is a real number that's greater than zero, and the magnitude of AV squared is a real number that's greater than or equal to zero, which means that lambda squared is going to be a real number that's greater than or equal to zero, which means that lambda is also a real number. And that's what we were trying to prove. Next, let's prove that if A is a symmetric matrix, then the eigenvectors associated with distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal. So let's take lambda 1 and lambda 2 to be distinct eigenvalues, meaning they're different numbers. And let's let v1 and v2 be the eigenvalues for lambda 1 and lambda 2, respectively. So what we want to show is that v1 dot v2 is equal to 0, but I'm going to start instead with lambda 1 v1 dotted with v2. So that's the same thing as the matrix A multiplied by v1 dotted with v2, and that's the same thing as taking A times v1, that column vector, and transposing it to a row vector, and then doing matrix multiplication with v2. Let me point out that I don't have to worry about conjugates in this proof like I did in the previous proof because we already know that our eigenvalues are real numbers from the previous proof. And from that, since A is also full of real numbers, it follows that, that the eigenvectors have all real numbers in them. So conjugating something that's completely full of real entries is irrelevant. Now I'll rewrite that transpose as V1 transpose A transpose times V2. But A transpose is the same thing as A, since A is symmetric. And since V2 is an eigenvector for A with eigenvalue lambda 2, I can rewrite this as V1 transpose lambda 2 V2. I can pull out the lambda 2 because it's a scalar. And now V1 transpose multiplied by V2 is the same thing as the dot product of v1 and v2. Therefore, we have that lambda 1 v1 dot v2 is equal to lambda 2 v1 dot v2. If I pull everything over to the left side and factor out the v1 dot v2, I have a product of two numbers equaling 0. But I know that lambda 1 minus lambda 2 can't be 0, since lambda 1 and lambda 2 are distinct eigenvalues, different numbers. Therefore, v1 dot v2 must equal 0, and therefore v1 and v2 are orthogonal, as we wanted to prove. The last thing I want to prove is that the eigenvalues of a matrix of the form A transpose times A are all non-negative real numbers. We already know that they're real numbers. Since B is symmetric, we need to show that they're either positive or zero. 
let's suppose that lambda is an eigenvalue of b, which is the same thing as a transpose a, with eigenvector v. That means that a transpose a times v is equal to lambda v. Let's look at the quantity v transpose times a transpose a times v. This product makes sense since v transpose is a row vector, a transpose a is a square symmetric matrix, and so this entire quantity ends up being a column vector of the same dimension as the row vector. But we know that v is an eigenvector of a transpose a with eigenvalue lambda, so we can rewrite this as v transpose lambda v. Pulling the lambda out, that's the same thing as lambda v transpose v, which is also lambda times v dotted with v, or lambda times the magnitude of v squared. On the other hand, if I go back to this left side, I can rewrite v transpose a transpose as a v transpose. And so this left side is going to be the same thing as a v dotted with a v, or in other words, the magnitude of a v squared. So now I have that the magnitude of a v squared is lambda times the magnitude of v squared, which means that lambda is equal to the magnitude of a v squared over v squared. It's no problem to divide by the magnitude of v squared since v as an eigenvector is a non-zero vector and therefore has non-zero magnitude. Well, here I have lambda as the quotient of something that's positive or zero on the top with something that's positive on the bottom, and so this quotient has got to be greater than or equal to zero. And that proves the theorem. In this video, we proved three facts about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of symmetric matrices. The key ideas in the proof were the definitions of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, the definition of symmetric matrices, and this key fact that when you take the dot product of two vectors, that's the same thing as taking matrix multiplication between the first vector transposed and the second vector. With the addition of a conjugate if the vectors happen to have complex entries.